Hello and welcome to College Physics 1, Lecture 24, Torque and Center of Gravity. In our previous lecture, we introduced the concept of rotational motion, that is, motion of an object spinning around a axis of rotation. This discussion takes us a step forward to talk about some of the biggest ideas related to rotational motion. We'll begin this lecture by just conceptualizing what happens when you push on a door in a number of different ways. So here is a picture. Uh, this is a top-down view of a door, so it's just a long rectangle, but you can use your imagination. This is a top-down view of a door. We are going to apply four forces to this door. All of them are equal in magnitude, but they vary in location and angle. So looking at these forces um, and using your own experience with pushing on doors, uh, this is where, if I was in a classroom, um, I put, go to the classroom door and actually push on the door to demonstrate this. But, use your imagination here, or even stand up and go to the door and try pushing on the door with these different forces. Force number one. Force one is at the end of the door, located where the handle of doors are typically um, situated. It is very easy to open a door if you apply a force to the outside edge of it. Again which is why we put handles on the outside ends of our doors. Force two, which acts at the exact same location, right? So if you're looking at this, force two is in the exact same spot as force one, right here at the end of the door. But the difference is this one is pushing straight in toward the hinge. Well, in this case, I mean, imagine pushing straight against the side of a door. You're not gonna cause any rotation at all. The door won't open. So this is completely ineffective, right? There's no opening of the door if you push straight along the line of the door. So even though it's the same size force and it's at the same location, we don't see anything happen. Well, force three takes this another step further. It's the same force magnitude again. It's also located at the same uh, position on the door, but this time it's located at, or it's uh, angled at some angle, in this case, roughly of 45 degrees. This force will still open the door like force one did, but not quite as much. So we say it's not as efficient. And then we go to force four. Force four is located closer to the hinge. If you have ever tried to push a door open uh, by pushing right against where the hinges are, it is very difficult to open the door. Even though it's the same size force as force one and it's in the same direction as force one. So it does open the door, but it's harder to do so. So this might seem like a silly exercise, but what we're actually doing here is starting to build an equation. An equation that describes how effective a force is at opening a door or rotating an object. So what we're starting to see is that the ability of a force to cause a rotation depends on three things. The most obvious, of course, is the size of the force. The harder you push, in other words, the greater the force F you apply, the more you're going to cause a rotation. That is fairly straightforward. But we also saw that the distance R matters as well. So the difference between force 1 and force 4 is that they're a different distance away from the hinge. Force 1, a greater distance, made it easier to open the door. So distance R. Now be careful, R doesn't necessarily mean radius. R is the distance between the pivot and the point at which the force is applied. You can see that labeled in the diagram on the top right of a wrench loosening a bolt. So, it depends on the force, how hard you push, and how far away from the axis R you are. But it also depends on one more thing, and this one is a little tricky. It depends on the angle that you push. That is the angle phi that you can see in the diagram on the top right. By definition, this angle, and this is important if you are in the class or working on problems, by definition, the angle phi is the angle between the force and the radial line. The radial line is an imaginary line that passes through the object. So it's, uh, I'm, I intend, that, intend for that to be a straight line, but it's an imaginary line here that's passing straight through the object, through the pivot point and the point at which the force is applied. So by definition, phi will always be the angle between that radial line and your force. 
So it depends on three things, force F, distance R, and your angle phi. Now, there is one additional thing we have to talk about here with the angle. You can see all this extra information on the bottom figure. Pushing straight along the object, so you can see like pushing parallel to the radial line, right along the object, is not going to cause any rotation. Just like we talked about with pushing on a door toward the hinge. What does cause rotation though, is a force perpendicular to the motion. So we care about the perpendicular component of the force. We don't care about the parallel component. So on our diagram, if you are just somewhat familiar with trig, we care about the perpendicular component of the force, the opposite side of this triangle here. So what that means is we're going to be using the trig function that uses the opposite side and the hypotenuse. And if you're familiar with trig, which if you've been following along with these lectures this entire time, you should be, the trig function that uses opposite and hypotenuse is sine of theta. So that's where that's coming from. So this is, uh, if you're a nerd like me, this is awesome. What we've just done is use a very basic setup of just pushing on a door to construct an equation. One that depends on force, distance, and angle. So put those three together and we have an equation for this new term, torque. Torque is given by those three variables that we just discussed. The distance r between the pivot point and the location of the force, the magnitude of the force, f, and sine of the angle, phi. And again, that angle, by definition, is the angle between the radial line and the direction of the force. So this is great. I mean, we now have an equation for torque. And this is actually backwards to how we usually introduce a new concept. Usually we define it with words first and then bring, the up, bring up the equation. But here we have an equation. We haven't even talked about what the heck torque even is. So let's do that. We've been making analogies in our previous lecture to regular motion compared to rotational motion. We had position and then angular position, velocity then angular velocity, acceleration then angular acceleration. Well, we can make a parallel here as well. Torque is the rotational equivalent of force. So just like force by definition is a push or a pull on an object, torque can be thought of as a twist or a turn. So we say it's the rotational equivalent of force. So you push or pull on something, it's a force. You twist or turn on something, it's a torque. So a bigger torque means you are more efficient at causing rotation. So extremely important to consider. Now, we have an equation, which means we need to know what the units are. So taking a look at this, we measure distance in meters. We measure force in newtons. So the unit is a newton meter. So you either memorize that or you just look at the equation. We have newtons of force times a distance in meters, so it's newton meters. And again, I hear I'm emphasizing direction. Remember, just like in linear motion, we said something that moves to the right is positive, something that moves to the left is negative, or in the y direction, vertically, something that moves upward is positive and downward is negative. We apply that same thought with rotation. So remember, counterclockwise is the positive direction, clockwise is the negative direction. So you will have to think about that sometimes. If an object is rotating around clockwise, don't forget to make it negative. And then, like we have done with forces in the past, if you have multiple forces that are acting on an object, each producing a torque, in other words, causing a rotation, you can find the net torque, the total torque on the object by simply adding up each individual torque. So if you have three torques on an object, calculate each one and then add them up to get the total. That is how you can find your net torque. So let's go ahead and work out an example. We've developed a new equation. Let's apply that new equation to work this out. 
So this is actually a fairly straightforward example, all things considered. Uh, there's not a lot of crazy algebra or anything involved. However, uh, what we are going to do is realize one important thing here, and that's figuring out what your angle phi actually is. So, example 24.1. It says, revolutionists pull down the statue of a leader by pulling at a rope tied to its head. Angled 65 degrees from the horizontal. The statue is 17 meters tall. So, they are pulling with a force of 4200 newtons. What is the torque? Okay, so, the very first thing, uh, or complication, is the fact, again, that it's hard sometimes to know exactly what angle to use. We're told 65 degrees, but is that phi? Is the big question you should be asking yourself anytime you calculate a torque. Is the angle I'm given a torque, or excuse me, is the angle I'm given phi, or is it not? So, I encourage you, if a picture is not given, which it is not in this case, I always encourage to sketch a picture of what's happening because that might help you a little bit. Uh, so let me use like, uh, let's see, maybe green here to represent the ground. Uh, so here's the ground. Why not? Mm -hmm. And then we have the statue. I'll just use, uh, I don't know, I'll just use yellow. The statue I'm going to just represent with a vertical line. Right? So. This is our statue that is 17 meters tall. I'm an artist, if you can't tell. So, uh, forgive my poor uh, abilities to draw. So that's our statue, and I'm going to just draw kind of a circle or a dot down at the bottom to indicate that this is the pivot point. So that's the point about which it rotates, right? So they're going to apply a force to this. Now, that force is applied from the top of the statue, right? Because it says it's attached to the head. So it's attached to the top of the statue and they're pulling down 65 degrees from the horizontal. So 65 degrees from the horizontal as shown there. So this is the force F that they're applying. So uh, this is our kind of visual of what is actually occurring in this problem. So again, just use your imagination, the yellow vertical line is the statue, and then the red vector shows the force that they are applying by a rope. Technically it's a tension, but that isn't really important here. So we need to figure out that angle. Is that phi? Remember the definition of phi. Phi, by definition, is the angle between the radial line and the direction of the force. The radial line is the length of the statue. It's that vertical yellow line. The force is the red line. So the angle phi is actually this angle here. It's the angle between the force F and the radial line. So 65 degrees is actually not the angle we apply in our equation. So that's the main reason I'm showing you this example, so you can see a situation where that might be the case. In other words, we have to solve for the angle phi. So how do we do this? Well, thankfully, we don't actually have to apply trig. We can recognize that this here is a right angle, which means it's 90 degrees. So we can take that 90 degree angle, subtract off the 65 degree angle that was given, to find our angle phi uh, being 25 degrees, 90 minus 65. Okay, well we have our angle, we are given a force F, and we are told the height of the statue. So we do know everything we need to calculate the torque. So we are now ready to actually solve this problem. We are looking for the torque given by Greek letter tau. By definition, this equation is RF sine phi. We do know all three of those things. But be careful, I'm purposely showing you this as well based on my drawing. If you look at the picture that I've set up, if they do pull the statue down, this object is gonna rotate kinda down and to the right. Think about what direction that is. That is a clockwise rotation. 
meaning it is negative, right? We said clockwise is the negative direction. So I'm gonna add in a, neg oops, a negative sign here to indicate that this is rotating in a clockwise or negative direction. So uh, we have negative, the radius, or not radius, excuse me, the distance r, which is by definition, the distance between the pivot point and the point at which the force is applied, so 17 meters. That's r. The force was given as 4,200 newtons. And then we have sine of 25 degrees. We then have a solution to the problem of negative 3 times 10 to the minus 4. Uh, I'm sorry, 3 times 10 to the positive 4. Newton meters. And again, it's only negative because it is rotating in a clockwise direction based on the picture that I have drawn. If you So if you weren't given this picture and you chose to draw it the opposite direction, so with the force pulling kind of down and to the left, then yours would be positive because it would be rotating in a clockwise direction. So if they were instead pulling down this way, you would have a counterclockwise rotation. So uh, it's only negative because of the way that I, in, I drew it in this situation. Okay, well, that is a good example of dealing with torque. We will see a bigger example using it later on. So this brings us to our next kind of topic here, gravitational torque and center of gravity. Well, real objects, uh, so basically everything in the real world, are made up of a ton of particles. I mean, countless numbers of particles. Technically, gravity acts on every single par particle that makes up an object. So basically almost an infinite number of torques are being exerted on objects, right? Because gravity acts on every particle, every particle experiences a torque, so we would have to calculate almost an infinite number of torques for any object, which is obviously not very ideal. So rather than make such a complex or long problem, we can simplify things a little bit. Rather than calculate the torque of every single individual point along an object, what we can do is simplify it and say, well, the weight of an object acts at a single point. So why don't we just figure out where that point is located and calculate the torque based on that? So the single point that we assume the weight acts on an object is called the object's center of gravity. The images on the right show you exactly how we simplify this. Rather than, in the first picture, looking at a number of different torques acting along this gymnast's body, why don't we just focus on the center of gravity, a single point where the weight force is applied. So this clearly will simplify things a lot for us and make our lives significantly more easy. So when we deal with this um, center of gravity, we do see something interesting happen at times. If an object is free to rotate, uh, in other words, it's only attached by the pivot point so it can swing freely back and forth. By definite, well, basically by definition, what will happen is it'll swing back and forth kind of like a pendulum, but it will come to rest always with the center of gravity directly below the pivot point. This is a very basic demo I showed in my class in person. I just bring a ruler into the classroom or typically a meter stick. I hold it at the tip like you see in this picture in the middle and you just let it swing back and forth and it'll always come to rest straight up and down with the center of gravity below the pivot point. So that'll always be true. And you can even do this just by holding your arm out. If you hold the arm out to the side and then suddenly let it go limp, it swings down and hangs vertically with the center of gravity of your arm below the pivot point, your shoulder. So this segues us to kind of talking about this center of gravity. So center of gravity is a great way to simplify our problems, but the complication here is the fact that we need to know where that center of gravity is located. It is not necessarily always in the perfect center of the object because many real world objects aren't perfectly symmetrical. For example, if you look at a human being, their torso and head weigh more than their legs. So the center of gravity would not be perfectly in the center of the object because it's not a uniformly distributed mass, like a meter stick would have. So we have to calculate, I probably should have put animations in here so I don't throw all of this on the screen at once, but we have to calculate the center of gravity, or uh, the, the, excuse me, the location of the center of gravity. So 
To do this, it sounds arbitrary at first, but it really makes a lot of sense when you think about it and start working on problems. To figure out the position, x, c, g, of the center of gravity, you have to choose a coordinate, point, uh, a coordinate system where you define the origin. So you define where the origin is, and then based on that origin, you specify the coordinates of the masses or particles that make up your object. So for example, you have two masses here, mass one and mass two, so you set your origin point, then you figure out how far away each mass or particle is from that origin. Using that information, you can then calculate the center of gravity x, c, g. To calculate it, we use the equations shown here in green. Note, I did not derive these equations. Uh, you can derive them, and uh, it just takes a little too long, and it's a little more complex than I like to show for the class. So um, if you are in my class and you have the textbook, you can reference the textbook to see where these equations come from. But I just don't see it worth the time to go through here. So you can take my word for it or look up how these equations come about if you are that interested, which if you are, that's great, honestly, um, that you care enough to actually look into it. But otherwise, just take my word for it. The center of gravity, x, c, g, is given by x1, m1, so the location, x1, and the mass, m1, plus x2, m2, and so on, for however many masses you might have. But... The complication here also is the fact that if it's two-dimensional, you also have to figure out the center of gravity in the y direction, the vertical direction. So with this information, I'd like to go ahead and do an example problem right off the bat to calculate these center of gravity uh, locations. We're going to choose a slightly more like com complicated example to work on together. Uh, because I think it's really helpful to see an example like this. So, example 24.2, it says a gymnast holds himself in the pike position on rings, like you can see on the right. His body can be considered to be made up of two segments. So, we're going to kind of split the person in half, like you see here, and consider two separate segments. I call it the body, the upper part, so this is what I'm going to consider to be the body, and then I consider this to be the legs. So we have two distinct parts of the body, um, the torso and head, which I call the body, and then the legs down below. So with this information, we can actually start to write down all the details we know. So to begin, let's start by just writing down the information. We're given all the information in this diagram on the bottom right, so let's go ahead and write it all down while it's there. Let's start with the mass of the body. I'm going to use B to represent body, the upper part, and L to represent legs, the lower part. The mass of the body is t given in the picture as 45 uh, kilograms. The mass of the legs is given to be 30 kilograms. So right now I'm just kind of building a data sheet, right? I'm recording all the information so that I can then plug it into my equations. Well, let's look at the x positions of both the body and the legs. So we need to know along the x axis or the horizontal axis, where is the body center of gravity located and where is the leg center of gravity located? Well, let's take a look. On the picture, the body is centered at 20 centimeters. The legs here are centered at 40. So, the position x of the body is 20 centimeters, and that of the legs is 40 centimeters. But we also have to realize that this is a two-dimensional problem, so we need to locate the positions in the y direction as well. So, uh, in this case, let's take a look at our diagram again. Along the y or vertical axis, the body here is located at 50, and the legs are located at 20. So the body was located at 50 in the y direction and the legs at 20. So you don't have to write all these down if you don't want to, but I think it helps to have it all labeled in our diagram. So right there we have all the information we need to now start solving this problem. Well, honestly, these are just tedious problems. 
you just have to plug in a lot of numbers. There's no algebra typically with these, there's no trig. So you really just have to make sure you can keep track of your numbers and plug them in correctly. Let's start with our x center of gravity, x cg. There's only two terms in this, in, in this equation because there's only two quote unquote objects we're considering, the body and the legs. So we would write this as xb mb plus x legs m legs over the sum of the masses mb plus ml. So just to be clear, this is following the equation on the previous slide, x1 m1 plus x2 m2 over the sum of the masses. Okay, well, let's plug in our values. Again, just keep track of everything. Uh, xb is 20 centimeters. The mass b is 45 kilograms. Plus the position and mass of the legs, so that is 40 centimeters times 30 kilograms. Okay, all of this divided by the sum of the masses, 45 and 30. All right, so hopefully you can plug this into your calculator correctly. This will give you 28 centimeters or 0.28 meters. Uh, typically we do go to base units, so I suppose I should uh, show that here. So let me just write this in meters for the sake of being consistent in our problems. 0 0.28 meters. Okay, well we had so much fun doing it the first time, let's do it again, because we have to calculate this in the y direction as well, because this is a two dimensional problem. The only thing that changes here is your x's turn into y's. The masses don't change because just by reading it in a different direction, your mass is still mass. So those all stay the same. So we're really just swapping two numbers in this equation out for our y values. yb we said was 50 centimeters. The mass of b or the body is 45 just as it was above, plus the y position of the legs, which is 20 centimeters, times the mass of the legs, 30, and again, all divided by the total mass, 45 plus 30. Now, I know it's annoying, but if you are in my class, and if you're a physics student, which I'm assuming you are if you're here, show your work. It's annoying to write out all these numbers, all these equations, all these units, but you should always show all your work, especially because if, I mean, I give partial credit, any physics instructor should give partial credit. So, you know, it's, it's important to try to get as much credit as you can throughout the problem. So this comes out to be 38 centimeters or 0 0.38 meters. So there you have it, your two locations of the center of gravity. And if you look at this, it is labeled on the diagram fairly correctly. Uh, so we see this is right here at about 38 and right here at about 28. So it actually makes sense based on the picture that is given to us that the center of gravity overall is at about 28 and 38 centimeters respectively. All right, well, let's conclude this lecture with some end of lecture questions. And again, as always, I encourage you to pause the video before I give the answer so you actually have time to think about it yourself. So question number one, this looks familiar to the beginning of this lecture. It says that four forces, all with the same magnitude or strength, act on a rigid bar at different locations. What is the correct ranking of the four forces in order of the magnitude of the torque they produce? So rank the torques produced by those four forces. Okay, well, let's hop right into this. Let us start by considering what F4 would be. I think that's the easiest one. Force number four is pushing straight along the radial line, right? So this force is pushing straight along this line it's not gonna do anything. You're not gonna cause any rotation at all because you don't have a component of the force pointing up or down to cause that rotation. 
In other words, f4 is the smallest. So let's look into our, our options here. We should see f4 being the smallest. Well, a shows f2 is the smallest, b shows f1 is the smallest, and e shows f1 is the smallest. So simply by realizing that f4 is going to be the smallest, in other words, zero, because it's not going to produce a torque, just by recognizing that's the smallest, we're narrowed down to options C and D. So let's just step through the remaining options here. Force 3 is going to be the most optimal in opening your door. It is both the furthest away from the axis of rotation, this F3 here, and it's pointing perfectly perpendicular to the object. So that is going to be your most efficient force. Both options C and D put F3 as the biggest and F4 as the smallest. So that alone still does not necessarily help us. So let's continue the discussion then. All we have to do is compare forces one and two. Force one is pointing perpendicular to the surface. So this is gonna be the bigger force. F1 is going to be bigger than F2. Okay, well, looking at our options, both of them are showing that as well. So the only difference between options C and D are to re uh, take a look at this here, uh, are to look at this difference. This is the only difference. Option C says force one and three are the same. Well, let's take a look. Are forces one and three the same? Well, they are the same size force right? They're the same magnitude. They're both pushing perpendicular to the door, right? F1 and F3. They're both pushing perpendicular, the same size, but force three is further away. So it's the bigger force. It has to be the answer D, right? So I kind of ran all over the place with my explanation there, but hopefully that made some sense. So let's just step through it again real quick. Force three is gonna be your largest force because it is the furthest away from the axis of rotation, it's the biggest, and it's pointing perpendicular. We know that force four is gonna be the smallest, it's gonna rank fourth. Force number one here is gonna be the second largest because it is pointing perpendicular but not as far away. And then force two is gonna be a little bit weaker than force one. It's at the same point, but it is at an angle, so not fully perpendicular. So that's the order. Hopefully that makes sense. There's a lot of numbers I threw around there, but that's how we think about that example. All right, last question for this lecture. A wheel turns on an axle on the center. Which of the given forces, there's a bunch of them labeled by the red arrows, will provide the largest positive torque? I italicized and I'm now underlining the word positive. So take a minute to think about that. Okay, let's step through them in order, alphabetically. For, uh, force A. Force A is a large force and it's far away from the center. But what is it gonna do? Well, if you apply that force here, it's gonna cause this object to rotate around in a clockwise direction. This is gonna be a negative torque. That's a negative torque. It's gonna to rotate it clockwise. It's asking about a positive torque. So that's not gonna do it. Let's look at tor uh, force B. Force B is applied here. It's a big force as well, but think about what direction that would cause the object to rotate. This is gonna cause it to rotate around in a clockwise direction. This one is also negative. Remember, clockwise is the negative direction. C and D. C and D are very similar. They're both pointing in the same direction. They're both pointing straight away from this radial line. This is the same as pushing on a door straight toward the hinges. You're not causing any rotation. The force is along the radial line. These are both zero. So A and B are both negative, C and D are both zero, so it turns out that the only force that causes a positive torque is E. 
Even though it's a small force compared to some of the others, it's the only one that causes rotation in the specified direction, the positive direction. So E is our answer for this one. All right, well, this concludes our lecture on torque and center of gravity. We will still use some of these concepts in our next lecture. Our next lecture, lecture 25, is rotational dynamics and moment of inertia. So that's kind of the ultimate lecture on rotational motion for us. We're going to kind of combine everything and analyze everything using Newton's second law. So, uh, as always, thank you so much for watching. I hope you learned something, and have a great day.